So hello everybody. Thank you, uh, thank you for, for being here. My name is John Lillich. Um, so today we'll talk a little bit, we'll sort of dive a little bit deeper into uh, cryptocurrencies, crypto assets. We'll try to understand it in a much, uh, let's say broader uh, financial context. Um, if you're on Twitter, feel free to add me. Um, I've got some slides, I won't go through all of them, but we'll kind of like touch upon some of the main points. Um, so you, many of you have probably seen this, but it's just a little bit of context on like how big money is, how big sort of, um, you know, the financial context relative to where we are with Bitcoin, although this is quite a, quite a while ago, but you can see there's a, sort of an ever-growing cascading set of opportunities for crypto assets to uh, play, you know, play a role. Um, okay, so this is an interesting slide because my interpretation of it is basically uh, there's really no way to guess the price of Bitcoin or any of this stuff. It's sort of very often uncorrelated to, you know, traditional assets where they might have some uh, indicators in the economy that kind of determine price. Um, with Bitcoin and crypto, uh, you know, this stuff is still very volatile and oftentimes it's extremely difficult to sort of predict what, what the price could be. Um, so many of you or some of you perhaps have heard of this notion of an ICO. Uh, or a token sale, and these are basically sort of issuance of crypto assets um, that can sort of take on many different forms. And so if you have an interesting software project and maybe there is a, uh, a, an application that you're building and critical to that application is the utility or the function functionality of a token, you can sort of sell that token on Ethereum, you can collect Ether, and in this way, we have this sort of equity crowdfunding model. And it's sort of eating the world right now. It's, it's definitely changing the way we allocate capital, particularly in the past where you would sort of have to go to a Silicon Valley venture capitalist and like beg for money. Um, so there's a few different kinds of tokens. Maybe some of you are familiar with protocol tokens. So these are things like Ethereum or things like AdChain representing um, protocols like token curated registries. Um, utility tokens are tokens that f sort of are necessary to the functionality of a particular piece of software. Um, there's a really interesting prediction market called Gnosis, and in order to sort of like uh, gain wisdom from the crowd and use the application, you need the token. And then of course security tokens. This is kind of the thing I want to highlight a little bit in this discussion. So securities are financial instruments that are issued uh, typically by very large financial institutions. Um, and these instruments sort of have an expectation of profit and you can, you can sort of purchase these instruments um, and, and so this is kind of the derivative, the securities market, if you will. Um, the security token market has yet to really take hold, but my contention here would be that if you're thinking about uh, crypto assets from an investor perspective or if you're an entrepreneur, um, think deeply about uh, how the traditional financial system works, how traditional assets work, and um, potentially how those can be replicated on blockchain. And the reason you'd want to do that is because, like if you think about Bitcoin, the reason Bitcoin is yours is because you have custody of the private key. Um, likewise, if you think about complex financial instruments, um, why wouldn't you want to have custody over that? Like why would you want to leave it in the hands of Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns or something? Um, and so when you're kind of designing utility tokens, there's a few different things to consider. Governance being one of the key issues uh, surrounding this ecosystem right now as far as um, exactly how the community interacts with various elements of your project. Um, okay, so there's obviously been a lot of news about you know, these massive token sales uh, generating tremendous amounts of money. Um, my contention would be that uh, and, and, and there's a variety, there's a spectrum of opinions on it. Some are sort of like, well, this is ridiculous, and others are really embracing what's happening. Um, my contention would be, again, if you think deeply about these things, the history of investing in tech has always been pretty ugly. There's always been sort of uh, venture capital allocated into tech where um, effectively capital was misappropriated or investments failed. Uh, the same thing happens quite often in this case. However, because it's on the blockchain, it's all very public. 
it's all very public, and, and because it's public, you sort of can't run and hide. Um, and, and because it's in public, then you know, the ecosystem evolves very, very quickly. So we're seeing tremendous evolution, and I would say progress in, on many fronts. Um, okay, so these are some of the like, ones in the past, Ethereum being kind of the first significant, if you will, ICO. Um, and there's been others since that have sort of done spectacularly well. Uh, these are just a few of them. I think the IOTA guy was just on stage earlier. Um, of course, there's a lot of different interest institutionally. MT Gox was a really famous kind of example here in Japan. Uh, Coincheck recently also became famous. <laughs> um, uh, you know, these are just some of the exchanges. Okay, so thinking about derivatives and and, and so diving deep, you know, more, you know, deeper into this conversation beyond just, okay, well, what is a Bitcoin? I have a Bitcoin, the price goes up, I can make some money, I can sort of like transact with it. Um, thinking much deeper beyond that and saying, well, what if there are financial opportunities that I can invest in where I potentially have a yield? Okay, so imagine a scenario where, um, let's take a developing country like the Philippines, for example, where real estate is growing very, very quickly. Um, and you wanted to sort of get a uh, exposure to that. Well, right now that would be very, very difficult using traditional financial instruments. There would be a series of friction points along the way that would make that sort of difficult. But uh, but if you could imagine in the near t in the very near term, uh, tokenizing so creating crypto assets that represent ownership in a building, let's say, or represent ownership or a claim to the yield generated, the income generated from a property. So imagine. Uh, a private invest, uh, private real estate investment fund owning a lot of assets, a lot of properties. Those properties generate revenue. The revenue from from those properties is converted into ether. Ether is put in a smart contract, and then you know that those sets of properties can issue their own tokens. And if you have a token, you can then withdraw your share of the ether or the yield. So this is a this is this is sort of like an opportunity to go beyond just holding and speculating tokens and getting into a position where you can generate yield, okay? So you get return on your investment in addition to holding the tokens. Um, and there's a bunch of projects and a lot of really cool stuff happening. Variable is a really interesting sort of peer-to-peer -peer decentralized platform where you can kind of like trade a lot of these um, derivative crypto assets. Uh, decentralized exchanges are going to be an important element of the, of the coming sort of uh, you know, crypto asset Web3 future. Uh, we have seen, obviously, here in Japan, um, most recently with Coincheck, and around the world in other places where the, the, you know sort of centralized exchanges have been compromised. Uh, I have to give a lot of credit to the guys at Coincheck. I actually know them. They like had the money and paid it back, which is amazing, um, and it's a testament to how well their business was doing. But as we sort of uh, you know evolve as this ecosystem proliferates around the world. It's very important that we have decentralized exchanges where users retain custody of their asset at all times. Like, you don't relinquish custody to an exchange and trust them to sort of not get hacked or breached. Um, so regulatory stuff, and, and I'll go through these slides pretty quickly. So there's, there's a lot of sort of existing laws, and, and some of those are difficult to navigate, and maybe well, obviously, weren't really constructed with crypto assets in mind. Um, but that is changing, and we're seeing regulatory change here in Japan. Uh, ob obviously, the FSA and other uh, you know, uh, regulators have issued licenses and guidelines. And this is sort of happening around the world. Uh, the SEC in the United States is actively s sort of making comments and taking action. Uh, and then, of course, you've got different jurisdictions around the world that are um, really competing to attract business. Most recently, Binance, which is a very large exchange out of China, moved to Malta uh, because they had favorable sort of regulatory conditions. Um, and so, as this, and so if you're thinking about it from an investor perspective, uh, uh, understanding the regulatory kind of landscape and as it shifts is very important because that's going to be the de the determining factor for when securities on the blockchain become much more ubiquitous. Uh, so these are just some of the places I was talking about. There's a bunch of stuff happening around the world. Uh, well, let's skip this stuff. Um, this is sort of Gibraltar. Gibraltar is interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting framework. They're really kind of innovating on the regulatory side. Um, 
and we'll kind of skip through some of this. This is called the Brooklyn Project. And, and the reason I, I, I'm kind of spending some time on the regulatory side of it is because, uh, again, I want to like emphasize how important uh, understanding what is happening on the regulatory side is going to be as far as uh, investors being able to make smart determinations about uh, you know, which, which assets and which uh, products uh, they want to they sort of invest in. Um, you're going to see derivatives and securities on the blockchain issued by groups that uh, either follow regulatory uh, guidelines uh, or don't. And the ones that don't are likely to be very, very high risk. Uh, that's, why it's, that's why it's important to kind of at least have a sense for all this stuff. In Brooklyn, uh, we, along with a bunch of others, kicked off a process. Um, it's a sort of collaborative effort between many different groups, many different regulators, and we're hoping to sort of help uh, construct guidelines for how to deal with these things. Okay, so um, thinking about exchanges, uh, again, CoinCheck was a big deal here in Japan and it's had tremendous impact already. Uh, there's massive regulatory change coming. The industry is changing very quickly here in Japan. So from a security pr perspective, um, you know, you will see more regulation and you will see more institutional participation. For example, I wouldn't be surprised if you see SoftBank Investment or some other major kind of institution like that. Um, either launch an exchange or heavily get involved in, uh, in this space very, very soon. Um, and then, you know, trust and security is another big one. So if you're an investor uh, and you're thinking about these things and you're using some of these services, you should deeply kind of, you, you know, you should, you should uh, be very skeptical and, you sh and, and deeply think about what kind of security measures are these exchanges using, particularly on the cold storage side. Um, okay, so... This is really interesting. If any of you are entrepreneurs, and if you're thinking about, okay, how do I get involved? Um, how do I uh, participate? And maybe some of you have financial backgrounds, maybe some of you don't, maybe some of you are software engineers. Um, so the first, first place I would really think about is vault management. Uh, so this is, this is sort of like, um, you know, you've got a bunch of crypto assets, and you know, there's a bunch of services around that that uh, entrepreneurs can provide to help kind of like collateralize those assets, for example. Um, token ETFs and index funds are going to be really interesting. Uh, there's a couple guys in the US, the Winklevoss uh, twins, uh, kind of funny guys. Um, and they tried to launch an ETF, but they were sort of rejected. I think the reason they were rejected was because they uh, really kind of totally miscalculated how to go about doing something like that. Uh, I think going public first and then talking to the regulator later was a terrible mistake. I'm not sure they're the brightest guys, but um, you will see more and more ETFs coming up. Uh, and then, of course, fiat token services. So um, one of the things to look for that, that'll be really interesting is when nation states start tokenizing fiat. So fiat is like Japanese yen or US dollars. I mean, the traditional money as we understand it. So you can imagine a scenario where uh, either a bank or a nation state or perhaps an entrepreneur that works with a commercial bank uh, sort of put some, let's say, Japanese yen in an account, and then issues tokens against those yen. And now this becomes a type of tokenized fiat. Uh, the reason that's really Im important is because it sort of creates a pathway in and out of the crypto fiat world. Um, so hosting ICOs and token trading, um, you're going to see more and more of these ICOs or token sales. Um, again, as investors, I would deeply, deeply think about uh, particularly on the security side, who is sort of uh, you know, following regulatory guidelines and who isn't, because that's going to be a determination, that's going to help you determine sort of your risk profile. Uh, so this is what I'm talking about when I say the tokenization of like the rest of the kind of global economy, which is much, much bigger than, than we realize. Uh, I mean, the derivative market, uh, we actually don't know how big it is. It could be 700 billion to 1.4 quadrillion dollars. Like, we don't actually know. It's massive. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and then, of course, public equities, fixed income, derivatives, real estate, etc. Infrastructure is another really interesting one. So, Japan has, uh, I guess, mega solar projects. And so, if some of you are entrepreneurs in, in the renewable space, you can imagine kind of like doing an ICO to finance the development of a mega solar project of which you get paid in yen uh, through these power purchasing agreements, and you could like convert that yen into ether and distribute it out to the people that participated in your ICO. 
And, and if you think about capital allocation and raising capital in a traditional sense, uh, that can be quite hard at times. But you know, this uh, sort of tokenizing, uh, you know, this, this would be a tokenized security. That, uh, this model could potentially be extremely attractive, not only here in Japan, but uh, around the world. Um, this is sort of less interesting. Maybe I'll skip through that. But if anyone wants to take a picture, it's just kind of a archi rough architecture diagram to give you an idea of how these things could work. Um, you know, so again, thinking about potential opportunities, value proposition, like, again, just think deeply about these things. Um, if you need some help and guidance around how to structure your thoughts, uh, the, you know, this kind of information is available online. But uh, as the secure, you know, as securities go on the blockchain, you're going to see a tremendous, tremendous influx of capital um, and many more sophisticated investors, uh, particularly people that are in the traditional finance world. And so as maybe recreational investors or new investors, um, you know, you want to really set yourself up for success by deeply thinking about these things. Um, you know, token analysis, you can sort of do, you know, business review, reputational review, technical review. You could also do like a legal review. So, you know, whenever you see a project uh, and maybe you're thinking about investing, um, don't just rely on what your buddy told you <laughs> or what you see on like Telegram. Um, this is another one you can you can sort of like take a picture if you want, but on the crypto cash side, I won't go too deep into that. You can sort of see how these things could work. Uh, Token-based ETFs and index funds. Again, you can take a picture; it'll give you it'll give you a sense. I've only got a minute and a half, so I won't go too deep into it. Um, vault management also, you can kind of get a sense. Um, so decentralized securities depository. Again, um, CESDs, we think, are going to be a big deal. Um, I'm seeing a lot of pictures. That's good stuff. OK, so that's me on Twitter, uh, if you want to find me. Um, and then I guess, you know, before, before we wrap this up, y you know, I, I, I think it's important to understand where we started, where we are, and kind of where we're headed. Uh, where we started was out of necessity. Um, if you think about something like Ethereum, or even before that, something like Bitcoin, Nobody would have ever given you permission to make Bitcoin, okay? Um, yet uh, it was totally necessary. It was like fun fundamentally an element that has sort of changed the world. Uh, as Bitcoin uh, performed beautifully, as it sort of maintained its sort of structure, um, doing this one simple thing, we started thinking about, well, how can we do other things in this blockchain context? And so Ethereum emerged. And, and post-Ethereum, we're starting to see um, sort of that evolution continue. Things like Definity are coming, et cetera. And along the way, people have been able to participate in this ecosystem. Uh, obviously, with ICOs, uh, direct participation. This is going to transfer, you know, this is going to continue into the security space, and I, and, I, and I think it's one of the most exciting opportunities of our time. So I definitely welcome it and, and, and hope you will too. So thank you very much. Thank you.